Well, good afternoon and welcome all. It's very exciting uh, that the time for this session is finally at hand. It's great to be together again, virtually as much as ever with all of you, with our really what's gonna be a tremendous roster of speakers and just with so many colleagues uh, from diverse areas of interest, sectors, backgrounds. My name is Mark Garevich and it's a pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Department of Population Health here at NYU Langone Health to the second of two virtual sessions for our fifth annual Health and Conference. Our conference theme this year is Health and Social Connectedness. The theme today is Social Connectedness and Resilience in the Context of Crisis, something that we've all been grappling with since the pandemic began obviously, uh, and today's session complements the session last month uh, that focused on social movements and connectedness. So as a Department of Population Health in a medical school, we bring a particular perspective in framing the agenda of these health and conferences. We really look at the world through a lens of sort of total population health, not the version of population health that's limited to the patients of a healthcare delivery system, um, but really more broadly, because while health care, of course, contributes to the health of populations, the health of a community, of a neighborhood, of a city, is really ultimately the product of a far broader web of determinants, of drivers. So we chose the title of our annual conference, Health And, to illustrate that point. And in past years, the conference has focused on health and place, health care, and education. That was four years ago health and racial equity and urban well-being, health and data science and public action, and health and childhood and opportunity last year. This year, we're focusing on an area that gets really right to the heart of things, health and social connectedness. You know, the backstory to our settling on this theme began last fall, in the fall of 2019, when we began to plan our fifth annual conference. And although there were other contenders for a primary focus, we really almost immediately reached consensus on this theme of social connectedness. So we began to invite speakers and then arrives COVID. So at first, you know, we began to reassess really from a safety perspective, whether even to hold the conference and we considered uh, skipping a year, but then it wasn't long until we, you know, what we now know really just became obvious that the theme that we had chosen to focus on social connectedness was really just at the very heart of what COVID so profoundly disrupts. I mean, it's rare to be able to be confident at the start of a conference that every one of the actually 500-ish uh, people who are attending today, right now with you, uh, you know, has personal experience of the main focus of our conversation today. So we knew we had to go forward. Sadly, it wasn't long until we began to grasp the sheer scale of the crisis's impact on connectedness. Whether, fail, whether it was sort of in failing to anticipate the full impact on mental health and well being of social distancing, from the heavier shelter in place version to the keep your six foot distance version, or to the very nature of our response co to collective threat and the obvious lack of cohesion evident in our failure to unite in confronting it, or to the interplay of social cohesion and trust with its profound implications for health equity in terms of vaccine uptake. And there are plenty of other concurrent crises as well, economic hardship, of racist police violence, of climate change, opioids. So, you know, even in, and now, even with our democracy's, you know, most basic functioning, I think there was, I mean, talk about a timely conference. In recent days, we've heard national level debate about whether societal healing should be welcomed or shun. So social connectedness and health are swirling. And it is such that this year, our conference is really focused on this question. How can we do better in fostering social connectedness, both for its essential human value and in service of our goal of improving health and health equity at the population level? That goal really is uh, core to our mission here in the Department of Population Health at NYU Langone. And so we count ourselves like beyond fortunate in being joined today by some of the most outstanding thought leaders in this field, really to help us sharpen our thinking, our research agendas, uh, and our strategies for action. 
So I'm gonna just briefly outline the arc of today's two hour convening uh, so that you can follow its progression clearly. Our keynote speaker, Dr. Eric Kleinenberg, a colleague from NYU downtown, whom I'll introduce more fully in a moment, will open the session with what's certain to be a totally thought provoking uh, overview of the sociology of connection. And his talk will be followed by an exceptional panel uh, discussing public policy initiatives to build social connectedness, featuring a conversation between our city's new health commissioner, Dr. Dave Choksi, and Shirley Franklin, former mayor of Atlanta and executive board chair of Purpose Built Communities, and moderated by Dr. Doug Judy, executive director of the Build Healthy Places Network. And Doug will introduce our panelists more fully uh, uh, before, before his panel. So that's the basic setup. There are a huge number of people to thank for our meeting today. I'll do that at the end. I really just want to mention uh, one, uh, my colleague uh, Lorna Thorpe, who in addition to leading our Division of Epidemiology and serving as Vice Chair for Strategy and Planning in our department, really was the architect and driving force uh, of the set of conversations that are about to unfold. So strong thanks, Lorna, and to Caroline Barnes as well for her support. A couple of quick logistics. We ask everyone, of course, to keep yourselves on mute, uh, but in, we invite you to post questions for the speaker and panelists at any time during the presentation using the Zoom chat box. And we'll get to these questions during the Q&A periods um, of both portions of today's program. To highlight questions over comments and just to help uh, those of us who are moderating, you know, when you type it in, consider leading with the word question. In terms of social media, we'll be tweeting throughout the conference from our Twitter account, which is at PopHealthNYC. So follow along and tweet your own thoughts about the conference using hashtag health and. And now we're ready to start. So for our keynote, we are extremely fortunate to have with us Dr. Eric Kleinenberg, a truly in the world scholar of urban studies, culture and the media, who is the Helen Gould Shepherd Professor of Social Science and Director of the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University. Professor Kleinigberg's most recent book is Palaces for the People, How Social Infrastructure Can Help Fight Inequality, Polarization, and the Decline of Civic Life. And among his other books, all seminal works are, and I'm mentioning these to you in the context of the theme of today, so other books are Going Solo, The Extraordinary Rise and Surprising Appeal of Living Alone, and a, a book called Heat Wave, a Social Autopsy of Disaster in Chicago, as I said, among others. And his scholarly work has been published in journals ranging from the American Sociological Review to The New Yorker and to Rolling Stone, in which he shared an annotated playlist about living alone. So I can't think of somebody better to uh, start us off with. Uh, it's a pleasure to pass the mic to our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Eric Kleinberg. Eric. Hey, th thank you very much, Mark. Uh, I, I hope you can hear me. Uh, yeah. and I'm coming through Good. okay. You know, you, you invited me to come and be the keynote speaker at this conference, and I was going to say yes no matter what. But a thing that I was really excited about was the possibility of uh, being a keynote speaker and being able to, uh, to to meet a bunch of my colleagues from the medical school because downtown we're in a different world. And I'm very sorry that we can't do that uh, today. But I, I I hope that when this pandemic ends, and uh, someday it will end. Uh, you know, we'll have an opportunity to do that. So I really hope to meet all of you in person someday. And because it's kind of an awkward context, you know, here, here we are on screens, like we're, we're used to it, but we still can't really see each other as much as we normally would. And uh, I hope someone will find a way to shout at me if uh, I go offline or uh, uh, I have technological problems. Uh, you know, being on screen is not the same as being face to face. I, I, I hope you'll all agree with me about that. Um, so today what I want to do is talk to you about my research in the context of what's happening in the world today and also the context of um, what's going to be happening in the world tomorrow. I, I want to report to you uh, about things I've discovered from sociological research over the last couple of decades and also how I see social science research is contributing to the reproduction or the production of a, of a better world and, and potentially a world that's connected in the right ways too. Um, and so I'm really uh, hoping this is the beginning of a conversation. Um, let's see if I can get my slides to advance. There we go, that worked. Um, 
I guess the way I wanna start is by talking to you a little bit about my, my response in uh, March and April uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic was really taking shape and the World Health Organization uh, declared uh, that the, the best way for us to protect ourselves during this uh, crisis until there was the appropriate vaccine or medication uh, is for us to practice this thing they called social distancing. And I understood what they meant when they said social distancing is the best survival strategy. Uh, but there was a part of me that thought, this is really the wrong concept for what we need to do to survive. Uh, you know, a big part of me thought, it, it's not really social proximity that puts people at risk of, of infection, that, that makes people vulnerable. It's physical proximity, right? I mean, it doesn't matter how socially close I am to someone. Um, it's, you know, whether they can cough on me or sneeze on me uh, or, or breathe too closely to me. That's what's going to make me sick. In fact, I started to think it's not social distancing, but it's opposite that we need. It's, it's a kind of closeness, a, a form of, so, of solidarity. I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times arguing, uh, you know, we, we need solidarity more than ever before because when uh, else can we see so clearly how our fate is linked to the fate of our neighbors? And if we fail to take care of each other, uh, if we fail to take the proper precautions, if we fail to educate people so that they can tell the difference between a novel coronavirus that's potentially lethal and an ordinary flu, uh, if we fail to have occupational safety measures in place so that people are, who are sick feel like they have to go to work uh, lest they lose their jobs, if we fail to promote the most basic kinds of solidarity, we will all be more vulnerable. And so I argued at the time, really physical distancing is the language we want to use, uh, not social distancing. And I, I kind of knew that uh, partly, oh, I just feel like I lost my screen. Um, I'm having a little trouble there. Maybe that maybe that's better. Uh, I- Good, you're good. I'm good, okay. So I, I, I felt like I knew that, uh, I knew that from earlier research I did. Mark mentioned this first book I wrote, it's called uh, Heat Wave. I called it a social autopsy of disaster in Chicago. And the, and the reason I called it a social autopsy is because I, I kind of broke from the conventional model of trying to understand death by looking at an individual body uh, and conducting an autopsy, a kind of conventional autopsy, where you uh, detect which organs broke, break down and, and, and what caused the death of an individual. I wanted to understand why in July of 1995, uh, there were 739 excess deaths uh, in the city where I grew up, Chicago. And I knew that to do that, I kind of had to look over the city and, and lift up the, the city's skin and, and see if I could identify the, the, the organs of Chicago that broke down and made this disaster so much more deadly than it needed to have been. Because at the time, the, the puzzle was that there were all these public health models that estimated how many people would die in given uh, 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 meteorological conditions. And they all kind of dramatically uh, underestimated the actual mortality that we had in Chicago. And, and all the medical researchers in, in the journals of public health were reporting that they, they couldn't explain why the death rate was as high as it was. And so that was, I, I saw that as a kind of an invitation uh, to do what I call the social autopsy. And one of the really striking things about the deaths that you know, I noticed right away and that had gotten some coverage when it happened is that these were specific kinds of deaths. These were deaths of people who died alone, uh, people who were uh, in their apartments, in their homes, uh, separated from family, from neighbors, uh, from, from, ser from service workers. Uh, and, and there was something really tragic about that, especially in a city like Chicago that prides itself a, a, as being integrated, a city of neighborhoods and strong social bonds. And I really wanted to understand, you know, how, how could this happen? And you know, one of the things that clearly happened in Chicago in 1995 is that the infrastructure broke down. And you know, typically when there's a, a crisis, a, a weather crisis, so the, the health crises of all kinds, we see over infrastructure get overwhelmed. And in Chicago, uh, everybody was turning on their air conditioning. And so uh, the power went out. Uh, people in poor neighborhoods were opening up fire hydrants. The city lost water pressure. Uh, if you're in a New York or another city, you know that when there's no power, you can't pump water up to higher floors on apart in apartment buildings. Just 
uh, tens of thousands of seniors in Chicago, older people who couldn't get water, who didn't have power. Uh, the transit lines were breaking down, the rails were literally, literally buckling, uh, uh, just traffic lights were going out, plates were expanding on bridges. So there was a kind of traditional hard infrastructure breakdown in Chicago. And I should say that that, um, you know, was definitely part of the story of, of you know, why so many people uh, died so quickly. Um, but also the health infrastructure broke down. There were about 45 uh, hospitals in Chicago in 1995. And at one point, 23 of them uh, were on bypass status. So the emergency rooms uh, could no longer admit new patients. They had no, they had no room for people. And the city in 1995 had no system for figuring out which hospitals were open and which were closed. And literally uh, ambulances were driving as much as 10 miles trying to find a place where a person with a heat related uh, illness could be seen. And as you know, better than anyone, if you've got a heat related illness, you really need to be seen quickly. Uh, and, and, the, and the whole city uh, response system uh, w w was overwhelmed. Now, I'm a sociologist, not really uh, a health uh, specialist in the kind that you uh, are, are used to speaking with, although I'm a sociologist who cares a great deal about health and tries to think about health from other angles. And so, whereas my colleagues who are epidemiologists did this extraordinary uh, case control study uh, that was eventually published in the New England Journal of Medicine where they were comparing individuals who lived and individuals who died to see which individual level risk factors mattered. I realized that there was a story to tell at the neighborhood level because neighborhood conditions were clearly going to affect uh, how people experience this crisis as they affect all experiences of crises, including the one we're in right now. And so I did what all sociologists do when they're starting to study a city. I kind of drew a map and tried to figure out, you know, which people, which places were most affected. And, and it, you're looking at this map right now that is the map of heat deaths in Chicago. But to be honest, it's a map that would also be the map of poverty in Chicago. It's the map of racial segregation in Chicago. It's the map of diabetes in Chicago. It's a map that has low life expectancy in Chicago. It's a map of crime, uh, violent crime in Chicago, uh, because these maps are fundamentally the same. This is uh, a, a map that is politically important uh, because it, it shows the clear lines of, of racial and class inequality in Chicago and the way in which they generate health disparities. You're looking at the South side and the West side, uh, which are traditional African-American segregated neighborhoods, um, forcibly segregated. Uh, and in a way, this is the most politically important and least scientifically interesting map that you will see all day, because it's exactly what you would expect to happen in a disaster, the, the poor and vulnerable neighborhoods uh, were hit hardest. But when I looked a little bit more closely at what was happening in Chicago, I saw something that people had not really noticed. And that is that if you looked very close, you could see that while many of the neighborhoods that had the highest death rates in Chicago uh, were, were poor and segregated, had a kind of everyday vulnerability, in many cases, they were adjacent to neighborhoods that were demographically identical but that had dramatically different outcomes. In fact, one of the things I learned is that several of the neighborhoods in Chicago that were the most, you know, the word we use now is resilient, that had the lowest death rates, uh, were in fact uh, also segregated, also poor, and physically across the street from the high death places. And I wanted to understand why. So I started to use this uh, sociological research tool we call ethnography or participant observation. I went and just started spending time in different neighborhoods to see if I could understand patterns that would explain why some neighborhoods did so much better than neighborhoods that were just like them demographically. It seemed to me like that was a really important thing to understand. And what you're looking at now are two neighborhoods. I'm gonna show you slides of two neighborhoods on the south side of Chicago. This is a neighborhood called Englewood. Uh, and this is a neighborhood across the street called Auburn Gresham. Now in 1995, both of these neighborhoods were 90 plus percent African-American and segregated, very poor, all kinds of social problems and health issues that show up all the time. This neighborhood you're looking at now, Englewood, was also physically depleted. Uh, it had a huge amounts of open land, abandoned uh, houses, uh, empty lots, uh, broken sidewalks, a real lack of commercial corridor. There weren't big grocery stores. Uh, the parks were in horrible shape, the little pocket parks. Not a strong set of 
uh, community organizations that had resources to protect people. And if you live in a neighborhood that looks like Englewood in 1995 in Chicago, your survival strategy is to hunker down at home and stay safe by being indoors. And that works a lot of the time, but in the heat wave, that means you're baking home, especially if you're alone. And what's more, if you live in this neighborhood and you don't sit outside all the time because this is not a, 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 a attractive landscape that draws you out, your neighbors don't necessarily notice if you don't go out one day or two days or three days. They're not looking for you to be in the same spot every day. So they don't think to come and knock on your door, even if they know you're there. This neighborhood, which is literally separated from Englewood by one street, is called Auburn Gresham. It is also very poor. It is also very segregated. It was one of the safest places you could be in Chicago during the heat wave in 1995. And physically, you can see that this is a place where the, the, the sidewalks are different. The stoops are different. It turns out to have a pretty active commercial corridor. There are stronger local community organizations in 1995 that are doing work to bring people together. And so Auburn Gresham, despite conditions that would make you worry about it in a heat wave, turns out to be one of the safest places on earth, right? And, and here's a really striking thing that I learned. Not only was Auburn Gresham significantly uh, safer and healthier during the heat wave, the heat wave death rate here was 10 times lower than it was in Englewood across the street. But in ordinary times, forget about the heat wave, in ordinary times, life expectancy in Auburn Gresham is five years longer than it is in Englewood. I have come to think about the difference between those two places as a difference in social infrastructure. And this is a concept I've been using in my work recently. It's the main theme of this book, Palaces for the People, uh, that Mark told you about in his introduction to me, which, it, which is about uh, how physical places and organizations can shape our capacity to interact. And when I say social infrastructure, I, I don't mean it as a metaphor. I believe that there is a social infrastructure that is just as real as the infrastructure for power or for water or for transit or for communications or for health. There's a real physical set of, 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 of physical places that shape our capacity to engage each other. And when we invest in social infrastructure, when we build it well, when we design it well, when we maintain it, when we program it, we get all kinds of returns to our social life that are massively protective of our physical health, of our mental health, of our community health, uh, of, of our civil society. And similarly, when we neglect our social infrastructure, if we don't think about what it is to, to build a place that works well for people, and we come to think that people's relationships with each other, the support networks are all about you know, culture and how much people care about each other, we fundamentally misunderstand the sociology of connection, and we fail to produce the kinds of interventions that could make people's lives better. Now, I, I, I uh, started my career working at Northwestern University. I grew up in Chicago, went to graduate school at Berkeley. My first job was at Northwestern. I spent a few years, 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 years there working on my um, heat wave project. And then I moved to NYU. And not too long after I moved to NYU, uh, this happened, and I'm sure a lot of you don't know much about the heat wave in Chicago because it's kind of a non-event uh, historically, but I'm sure everybody here knows about Sandy, which was a major uh, event for the United States at least. And you all remember this kind of stunning image probably of downtown, you know, lower Manhattan out of power, which seemed pretty improbable, uh, but it was. And uh, I lost power in the institute that I run at NYU, this Institute for Public Knowledge. and. Uh, when we came back, I wrote an email to, to people in my network and said, look, we want to start a, a major research project to figure out what's gone on in our city and what's going on now. And so if you're interested, please show up at this date, the first day we got our power on. Enormous numbers of people came. We wound up doing an incredible amount of, of research. Uh, and I was writing articles and doing lectures. And I, I, I wrote an article in The New Yorker called Adaptation about what had failed in, in New York City's social infrastructure and hard infrastructure during the crisis. And a few weeks later, uh, I got a call from someone in the Obama administration. And um, I don't know if anybody here remembers the Obama administration, but we used to have this thing called the Obama administration. It was a long time ago. Uh, and they were interested in, in doing something different as they thought about rebuilding after Sandy. And basically, you might not know this, but the, the law in the United States says that uh, a, after a disaster, if you get FEMA funds, 
you can't build something that's better than what was there before. You have to build back what was there before, nothing better, because the federal government is suspicious of local governments. Uh, you're, I guess we're seeing that uh, as we count the uh, ballots right now uh, or, or deal with the counted ballots. Uh, but, 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 but this extends to many areas and FEMA doesn't let you build something better. And the Obama administration said that doesn't make any sense now that we've, especially now that we've uh, exited the Holocene and entered into the Anthropocene, uh, we should really be thinking about building infrastructure for 21st century cities. And so they came up with this idea for a thing called the Rebuild by Design competition. And they took a couple billion dollars from the federal government's uh, $50 billion uh, bailout bill, disaster relief bill for Sandy. And they said, we're going to have a competition and invite design teams from all over the world, uh, you know, engineers, architects, uh, city planners, landscape architects. Uh, we we wanna bring teams in and have them propose ideas for how to build infrastructure that will work for the 21st century. And surprisingly, uh, they called me and they asked me if I would be willing to serve as the research director for that project. Uh, which wound up being based at NYU, and it was a very exciting uh, uh, thing for us to do. And, and so these uh, design teams came from all over the world. Uh, there are 150 teams that applied. Uh, there were 10 that were uh, finalists. And it was a nine-month process. It was a really unusual competition because instead of bringing a design first and competing through a specific design for a place, the teams competed in the first round by just having a mission statement and a roster. We selected 10 teams or the federal government selected 10 teams. And then they had to go through a nine month process where they did three months of research, three months of outreach with different stakeholders, small businesses, local governments, large businesses, congressional officials, et cetera, civic groups, and then three months of participatory design. And the idea was to have a really thoughtful process uh, where you could uh, co innovate collaboratively. And because I was the research director and the first phase was to do research, I impressed upon the teams the significance of social infrastructure and, and, and made it clear uh, that, that as I see it, uh, and the Obama administration took this position too, we should always think about infrastructure as having a social dimension. If you're going to build anything, you should think about the kind of social impacts it will have and think about possibilities for making infrastructure systems, no matter what they are, uh, so that they're more socially uh, beneficial. And this, this is a very high profile uh, design competition. Uh, there were a lot of teams that had, you know, potential to, to get hundreds of millions of dollars or potentially billions of dollars for, with, with additional funds to do large scale work that would be the work of, 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 the, of their careers. And um, one of the teams that was in the competition was made up of um, designers who'd done a lot of work uh, in the Gulf after Katrina. And they really wanted to embrace this idea of doing something social, of building social infrastructure. And they came up with this concept where they said, you know, we, what we want to do, they told me, is a resilient center. They said, you know, we're really interested in, in coming up with an idea for a, a new prototype for a building that would be, you know, in different neighborhoods across the country. And it would be open, they said, you know, every day of the week if possible, maybe six days a week. Uh, it would be staffed by these resilience specialists whose job would be to be like aggressively welcoming to people who, who were in the neighborhood. Uh, they wanted every, the doors to be open. They wanted everyone to feel like the resilience center was a home away from home. They wanted young people to be able to go there uh, and, uh, you know, have story time and sing alongs and, uh, you know, education programs in the morning. They wanted older people who are, you know, more bound to the neighborhood than others to be able to to feel at home there engage in social life there to to be there together uh they they, they wanted this to be a very special place uh and they pitched this idea to me and it was very exciting and, and i thought oh there's a really interesting idea that as we try to think about how do we build resilience in society we're not just building hard infrastructure we're actually building physical places but i have to say that the thing that they described to me seemed very much like a piece of infrastructure, the civic infrastructure that we already have, but that I, I fear we've taken for granted, and that is the library. And I realized that in fact, you know, one of the extraordinary things about the United States is, you know, once upon a time, we came up with this idea that there should be public goods and that we should coll collectively uh, pool our resources, we should pay some tax money so that even though we're a little worse off individually uh, because we, we've given up some, some of our own personal uh, wealth 
uh, to government, we're building institutions and physical places that make the collective better off. And so we are really a remarkable society and New York City is an especially remarkable city in the extent to which we have already invested in a, 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 a social infrastructure that uh, is incredibly uh, receptive to, uh, amenable to, and even a generator of local civic life. Um, the library, the American Public Library is an amazing institution, uh, but what happens during downtimes, and I fear that we are entering into a downtime, especially around municipal spending, uh, is that we tend to take these kinds of places for granted uh, and stop investing in them. And we reduce the hours and we reduce the staffing and we make them a little less nice inside. And as a consequence, uh, people become a little bit less likely to engage with each other. The image I'm showing you here is the Seward Park Library, not too far from NYU on the Lower East Side. And it's a fascinating place to visit uh, and understand uh, because it's in this neighborhood that's going through this gentrification process that's very pronounced. You know, we think of the Lower East Side in historical terms as this great immigrant neighborhood uh, that's a, a, a place where people, you know, come to enter into American urban society. Uh, it's, a, it's a place where people live tightly in small apartments. Uh, where you know that you 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 kind of see this classic American experience play out is also a place where you can go and get a twelve dollar ice cream cone right now, right? So like if you if you are the kind of person who wakes up in the morning and thinks to yourself, you know, where can I find uh, a, a place that sells ice cream uh, where the only flavor is salt uh, and they only take credit cards? You would go to the Lower East Side and you would find what you're looking for. It's that kind of place. And you see the clashing of these worlds when you when you go down there and you can see first the potential this has for being a very segregated experience and a very divisive experience in a society that's coming apart. And you can also see that, like, while there's a, a set of places, you know, where people who look like this feel very much at home, uh, there's another set of places where people who don't have a lot of options for where they can go uh, wind up sitting. And what's what's fascinating is even the kind of uh, fast food, uh, you know, low level, uh, you know, social establishments, the McDonald's of the world, uh, you know, they have these loitering signs up and, you know, someone like me, I could go in there and bring my laptop and sit in a McDonald's for, for hours before anyone would say anything to me. And they probably never would. Uh, but for a lot of people, these loitering signs are, are really taken seriously and the loitering rules are enforced. Uh, not long after I took this photograph, you might have seen the story. There was a, a community of elderly Korean Americans in Queens uh, who got kicked out of a McDonald's where they congregated every morning. Uh, even though they were paying for breakfast and eating, they were, they were there too long, management deemed. Um, but in contrast, you know, we have these special places like libraries, and they're, and they're not many of them, uh, that are literally open to everybody, regardless of their, their age, their ethnicity, their social class. Uh, their citizenship status. Uh, and it is a remarkable thing that we have these things. In fact, like one of the things I encourage you to do is you know, like go to have this thought experiment, experiment. Imagine for a moment that there was no such thing as a library. And, you know, we decided that at the end of this conference, we were going to go pitch Governor Cuomo on this idea that, uh, you know, we go out and raise some philanthropic support, uh, but but basically have the public sector sponsor uh, a, a library system in which we have these, you know, a giant building with uh, marble lions in, in the middle of Manhattan, and then some big buildings scattered around, but, uh, you know, impressively sized buildings in every neighborhood of every city in New York and in every suburb. And we staff them with public employees and we fill them up with cultural items, which we let people use or borrow for free. Uh, and we do it all in an honor system. Uh, and everybody's welcome. I mean, if we didn't have a library system already, do you, does anyone think that we could actually get a political official to start and, and support a thing like that? It's, it's, it's remarkable that we have this, but you see this thing happening every day. And I'm bringing this up because when we have this conversation about connection and, and what it means to build bridges or what it means for us to provide social support, I, I, I believe that a lot of the conversation that we have about this is done in the realm of, of culture and values and belief and what can we get people to be nicer to each other and what can we do uh, to promote a culture of caring and what can we do uh, to make people realize 
how valuable social ties are. The health research tells us that social isolation is deadly and loneliness is deadly. And we, we talk about this as if it's about feeling. And that what I'm showing you this for is I want you to see that from a sociologist perspective, it's also about our access to good social infrastructure. And if we live in a society where the doors are closed and you can't get into places like libraries that can uh, host and support convening and gathering and companionship building, uh, you get all these good things. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if the doors are open, you get the good things. If the doors are closed, you don't get them, right? And there's this morning scene uh, that happens in libraries in the city every day where people learn, you know, not just to come together, but also what it is to be a citizen. And like one of the things that I think is so remarkable about what happens in institutions like, like libraries is, this is a, a photograph of a girl who happened to come in this day uh, to get her first library card with her mother. And it occurred to me as I was watching this, it's, it's amazing when you get a library card, you're not just getting the privilege of being able to take out a book uh, or a video, you're also learning that when, first of all, you're being recognized as a, as a citizen or as a member of a society um, who, who has the, the access to this, that society's good things. But second, you learn that when you get one of those good things, when you get that book, you're now not getting just a privilege, you're also getting responsibility because you know that you have to return that book so other kids who are like you can have a chance to use it too. And you feel self-interested in that because if they return the books that you want to read, then you have a chance to get those things too. And in a strange way, this process, which I bet many people on this Zoom call right now have had, where you get your first library card or your child gets it, it's a way of becoming part of a community that is bigger than you and bigger than your family. And it's that kind of social integration and integration into a civic system uh, that we need to be thinking about, not just because it matters for politics uh, and neighborhoods and community, but also because it matters for our health and well-being, right? And, and, and you see this, you know, you, you see it play out when you go to these classes and you see kids who would never uh, otherwise wind up playing with each other if it was just for the, for about their families uh, in a segregated society uh, engage. Uh, you see it when you see people who would be excluded from uh, our cities, uh, excluded from our collective culture, uh, find ways of, of acculturating, uh, of, 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 of becoming American. And I love this image uh, above all. One of the things that happens in New York City, actually it's in, in the Brooklyn library system, uh, once a week is they have a program called Library Lanes. And it is a virtual bowling league for older patrons of the library system, the people who are most at risk of dying in the heat wave, right? The people who were most likely to be found alone, deceased in their apartments in Chicago in 1995, are invited to come to a, a Brooklyn branch library once a week, participate in a virtual bowling league. They get bowling jerseys, they hook up a television to an Xbox, they call uh, librarians at other libraries and they, they play matches against each other as members of teams. And when I see the faces of these people, I encourage you, I invite you, I uh, uh, implore you to look at the faces. I, I can't help but think how easy it would be for each of these faces uh, to be uh, blank and despondent because the person uh, is just sitting in their apartment, uh, isolated and alone. We have more older people living alone than ever before in our nation's history. We have more people living alone in our ever before in our nation's history. If we want people to be engaged with each other, connected to each other, supportive of each other, it's nice to give people compelling things to do that they will enjoy doing. Right? People don't go out and build community and support systems because they wake up in the morning and say, you know, today would be a great day to go build some community. Most people aren't wired that way but people do like to do things that they enjoy doing and they build relationships in the process of that. So whether it's families taking their children to the playground in the, you know, in the afternoon or on a weekend and meeting neighbors while pushing their children at the swing set and having that go from a casual conversation to a play date, to a friendship, to a community that's of neighbors who live and share a playground with each other or whether it's older people uh, who, who, build relationships at a local library, the public realm, public institutions, shared institutions, shared gathering spaces can be tremendous at structuring 
and supporting those interactions. Of course, you could do that in the private sector too. If you have access to a country club, I'm sure your country club has a great swim team and golf team and tennis team and all of that. I'm not so worried about the people who wind up in country clubs, although they have their issues too. I'm worried about how we create uh, opportunities for connection and bridging for everyone, uh, including the people who stand the benefit from them the most. And you know, if, if you've been tracking social science at all, one reason I love the poetry of library lanes in Brooklyn is because a couple of decades ago, the political scientist Robert Putnam wrote this book called Bowling Alone uh, that really set people uh, uh, up for this feeling like communities have collapsed. Uh, we're, 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 we're rolling, we're rolling our bowling balls alone uh, these days. Society is falling apart. Um, you know, he was onto something when he wrote about atomization and the collapse of traditional communities. People are not going to the Elks Club as much as they used to, but there are all kinds of new ways that people are uh, connecting with each other. And I think we should see the exciting things that we're doing in some of our public institutions to make that happen. And uh, I, I can't show images like that enough. If you want to promote health, you know, it's, 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 you know, kind of one thing to go around and, uh, you know, teach people uh, how to stay healthy and eat right. Uh, but it can be equally, if not more powerful, uh, to just give people a way to be together and enjoy the time that they have together so that they're not as isolated as they otherwise might be. This happens every week, uh, but only for the people fortunate enough to know about the program and get included in the program. And if you ask libraries around the city or public institutions around the city, you know, do you have the resources you need so you can really be helping all the people with needs and interests, uh, they will laugh at you because of course the answer is no. And I fear uh, that the answer is going to be an even more emphatic no uh, in coming years as we deal with the fiscal crisis related to COVID. In fact, you know, what's happening around the world and in the United States is that public institutions like libraries are being shuttered. Uh, they're, they're considered luxury goods. They're considered to be, uh, you know, irrelevant or antiquated. Uh, not too long ago, uh, an economist in New York wrote an article in Forbes magazine saying, uh, live, you know, show me the cost benefit analysis that cashes out uh, the return on investment for libraries. And if you can't do that, I propose we knock down libraries all over the country and replace them with Amazon shops. And I have to say, uh, you know, the response to this article was not great. Uh, he, he got pilloried, uh, especially on Twitter where the librarians of the world united uh, and basically took the argument down, showed all the things that libraries are doing. Um, but, you know, I don't know how much you've been tracking how communities have responded and municipalities have responded to the COVID crisis. Um, but I will tell you that in a lot of communities, libraries have been a lifeline. Uh, you know, creating all kinds of virtual programs, providing, you know, Wi-Fi access to people who come and drive near them, uh, doing, uh, you know, book drops, up, drop offs or curbside uh, pickups. Uh, it's been amazing to see the ways in which our public institutions that have had enough resources to do something have done something uh, these last several months. And, you know, it's my, my uh, ardent uh, hope that we uh, make sure that, 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 that they're able to continue doing that. Certainly, uh, I don't think we can rely on Amazon uh, to do things in the public interest that are not also going to mainly contribute to their bottom line. These things matter because we are uh, in the 21st century uh, confronting a range of challenges uh, that we are just not prepared to meet. And we're seeing that right now in our collective failure to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. We, we've also been seeing it in our uh, struggles uh, dealing with climate change. Uh, the, here again, we're on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, um, uh, not too far from uh, NYU again. And uh, many of you know that, that our area of New York City flooded catastrophically uh, during Sandy and is prone to flooding now. In the Rebuild by Design competition, we thought about, you know, what would it mean to bolster social infrastructure while also, uh, you know, building up a hard infrastructure to make uh, life on the Lower East Side better all the time. One of the winners of the uh, Rebuild by Design competition was a plan uh, for Lower East Side coastal resiliency uh, that came from uh, the big team, which is headed by the uh, Danish architect Bjarke Engels. And we worked on this idea that if you're going to build a flood protection system for a, a riverbank area where the, the river is uh, vulnerable to storm surge uh, and to catastrophic flooding, instead of just building a giant wall uh, 
you know, we, we, you could actually build it like a, a sloped or kind of tiered parkland that has the capacity to absorb stormwater as it comes in uh, and can protect the inland area, but can also double as a recreational facility, as a park, as a, as a bike path, as social infrastructure on a daily basis. And, and one of the things that I've been urging uh, the teams I work with to do and the cities I work with to do uh, is, is, is to make sure you're always looking uh, for the, 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 the dual use benefits of any infrastructure project that you're planning. Uh, no matter what it is, think about how it would work as a social space, as well as how it will uh, handle the acute immediate crisis you're looking to stop. So for instance, a, uh, uh, a storm. Uh, I wanna talk very briefly before I wrap up about uh, another really exciting project uh, that I've learned about and that I wrote about in Palaces for the People. Many of you probably know about it because the, 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 the lead uh, uh, scientist on it is an epidemiologist named uh, Charlie Branis, who now teaches at Columbia, uh, but used to be at Penn. Uh, and, and, and he and his colleagues uh, in Philadelphia uh, did the, have done this incredible uh, series of research projects where they worked with the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society and the city of Philadelphia to deal with the fact that there are tens of thousands of uh, abandoned buildings and empty lots in Philadelphia, just as there are in Chicago and many other Rust Belt cities that were causing uh, blight and, and they thought maybe contributing to violence uh, in the city. And so they, they, they came up with an idea of doing a natural experiment or doing an, an experiment, I should say, in which they uh, uh, got permission to uh, take a, a number of uh, empty lots and abandoned buildings uh, in uh, poor areas of Philadelphia and uh, turn one set of them into uh, neat little pocket parks uh, uh, or just kind of more beautiful places so that instead of having a, a source of blight in your neighborhood, uh, you had something that looked more like an amenity. And what they found incredibly is that when you spent even a small amount of money to improve a, a small area like this, uh, you could get dramatic reductions uh, in rates of local gun crime uh, because uh, when you have an area like this, it's kind of an attractive place for uh, you know, people who are involved in crime or potentially violent crime to go. It's very difficult for a neighborhood to control an area like this. People aren't really hanging out there, so they don't want to, no one's really watching what, what happens there. Uh, th these things may be kind of incubating or promoting violent crime in ways that we haven't fully understood. Uh, whereas if you, if you make something like this, uh, it's, it's much easier uh, to, to organize uh, and, and maintain and control. And so not only did they find that uh, making a, a physical intervention, create, you know, turning uh, abandoned space into social infrastructure, uh, not only does it reduce gun crime in this area, but it reduces gun crime overall. Like, situations create uh, opportunities for criminal behavior. It's not just the people. And it's not like the crime just happens on another block. The crime rate goes down absolutely. And they also found, I should say, by by way of a, a health story, that residents of the neighborhood, uh, as they walk by places that look like this, they, they hook up their, uh, their some, some set of people, they, they, they hook them up to Garmin heart rate monitors and found that when you walk by a place like this, even if you live in the neighborhood and know it well, your heartbeat tends to race, uh, you get stressed, right? this affects your physical health and well-being to live in a place like this, it affects your mental health and well-being, because places like this stress you out Whereas when people who live in the neighborhood walk by a place that looked like this, their heart rates hardly change at all. So there's a ways in which fixing up the social infrastructure of the places we live uh, can have an impact on us, not just during crises, but every day. I'm talking about all this stuff about infrastructure and social infrastructure because I believe we're entering into a time where uh, it is inevitable that we are going to change the way that we have organized our cities and communities. Mark, I'm gonna wrap up in one minute. Uh, we are starting, uh, we, 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 infrastructure week is coming. Uh, we are going to have to invest in ourselves and in each other and the places uh, where we live. Um, we, we know this is about to happen. Um, one model of infrastructure we've had recently is the wall. Uh, I think this is 
uh, the most anti-social infrastructure you could possibly imagine. And I think it also doesn't work. Another idea we have for social infrastructure comes from Silicon Valley. And the idea is if you want a meaningful community, right, Mark Zuckerberg tells us the place to go is Facebook. Facebook should be where your meaningful community happens. It is my view that both of these ideas are wrong. And that if what we're really interested in doing is promoting connection and well-being and health, uh, we should be thinking about the kinds of physical social infrastructure that we already know helps people out, that is making a difference already, and that could do so much more uh, if we gave it the attention, the respect, and the resources that it needs to work well. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Eric, thank you so much. That was like just a totally riveting overview and 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 deepening, I think. Uh, so um, really from the start where you began to draw the sort of distinction between physical and social distancing, and I think in a sense uh, carried that like sort of all the way through. How do you, uh, so to the to participants, uh, if you have questions for uh, Professor Klanenberg, please enter them into the chat, beginning with the word question, and uh, we'll try to get to some of them. And uh, let me just ask you, you know, how do you um, think about approaches while COVID is still present and uh, social and physical distancing is, uh, is still a priority? Um, are there, it, it, is it just that's so it's just too bad it's a virus and we're a society of a species of animal that is socially uh tropic and this is interfering with it uh uh tough or are there things do you think that are could still be done now uh that would um get at that uh, uh some of that isolation and pain well i mean i think we are a very social species and i think we're all tired and stressed uh from all the distancing but let's face it, we've also learned that there are all kinds of ways that we can be with each other physically. Like we can be with each other outdoors if we're wearing masks and if we're keeping distant. Um, that seems to be a relatively safe way to be. It's not 100% safe, but nothing is 100% safe. And you know, one of the really stunning findings that came out from some colleagues of mine, uh, again, like a computer scientist, uh, some sociologists, uh, uh, at Stanford in, in a paper in, that was published in Nature last week, and maybe some of you read about it in the Times, is that one reason that um, poor immigrant neighborhoods fared so badly during the pandemic is people who live in them tend to uh, shop and congregate in smaller, tighter indoor public spaces and, and to lack access to the kinds of outdoor social infrastructure and more generous gathering places that more affluent people take for granted. So it might be the case that our, our access to uh, safe places uh, extends uh, to, uh, to, to health in ways that we don't always consider. So I think, um, you know, again, we need to stay physically distant. I am a big advocate of physical distancing. Uh, I am not a big advocate of social distancing. We need to be uh, socially uh, proximate. We, ne we need social solidarity like never before. And if we, if we think of ourselves as socially distant, it's the kind of everyone's on their own. We come up with some of the uh, you know, broken strategies that we've used to try to get through this crisis. Uh, you know, one of which is to say like, I get to do whatever I wanna do and you get to do whatever I wanna do. And I'll respect your right, Mark, to wear a mask. You just respect my right not to wear a mask. Um, and we've got to break that madness. Yes. Um, another question. Um, there's a, a lot of good questions. Here's one. Um, the role of healthcare. Let, let's see if we can uh, get two uh, or three quick ones in. Role of thoughts on role of healthcare as a as a sector in fostering um, public space and sort of social, really social infrastructure. Let's say through the public hospital system or otherwise. So I actually have a chapter on this in, um, in Palaces for the People. Uh, I think we should think expansively about the different ways that places can shape health, um, but that extends to the healthcare provider arena as well. 
um, you know, we know we have great evidence on what happens in a hospital if, you, if, if patients and the families of patients have access to green space and outdoors and, and something that allows them to relieve the, the pressure and the stress of being in that setting, right? We, if you think about um, one of the issues I know you and your colleagues must be worried about right now is that people aren't going to the doctor uh, for all kinds of ordinary conditions because they're afraid of getting COVID. And one of the things that keeps us from going to the doctor is the feeling that the, that the, the places where a lot of, pr pl of uh, organizations provide health care, they feel unsafe. They feel unhealthy. You know, a friend of mine once said, if you want to stay healthy, just stay out of the hospital. Uh, you know, so, so what, how do we create uh, places that provide care that allow us to, to feel like we're being taken care of? Um, you know, we're, we're, we're more than just objects. And so it seems to me like that's really important. And there are probably all kinds of ways that healthcare providers uh, could help to build and support communities around them as well. Um, and there'll probably a lot of people on this call have been thinking about that more than I have. Great. Uh, a question on uh, thoughts uh, that the, uh, that you want to share with a new administration about promoting social cohesion uh, at it broadly. Is the new administration on the line? Do we have the new administration <laughs> on the line? That would be very no. Good. no yeah, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But we'll uh, pass it on to them separately. Look, I mean, I, I guess the, I, I mean I think it's pretty clear in the talk I just gave. I think that we need to take social infrastructure seriously. When we, right. when we invest in infrastructure, which we're going to do because there's going to be something like a new deal, um, eventually we're gonna to have to build our way out of this economic crisis that we're in. We're gonna to have to put people to work. Um, we're going to have to build things because our infrastructure doesn't work. We need, to make, we need to be considering how the projects we are supporting are going to affect our, our social life. And I think we need to explicitly be, be more supportive of things like parks, and playgrounds and libraries and schoolyards, you know, so that we, so that people have a place to gather. And we should, and we need to think about the special needs of older people. We have more older people than ever before. We are an aging society. Uh, we've done, not done nearly enough to think about how to maintain health and well-being. Um, as, as a lot of the older people who are, you know, sixty-five and above, are not really old in the way that we used to think of it. They're, you know, and they're capable of maintaining health and well-being and vitality for many, many years, it's in all of our interests to find ways to promote healthy aging. And that's, you know, that's something that should be a priority. And I think the new president has a self-interest in that. Do, do you, th I, and so the last question really is that uh, the aging are, are especially vulnerable, as you pointed out really from the beginning, but yeah. there has been a lack of societal sort of embracing of the notion of prioritizing um, uh, 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 programs and support and and and, uh, and for them, uh, do you see uh, that shifting? Well, you know there 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 are more old people, and so they have even yep. more political power. Uh, and you know, as I said, we you know we we've had a a, a pretty old president these last several years, although not one with much of a moral conscience. I think we're getting a, a president who's going to be old with a moral conscience. Uh, it, it's probably, a, you know, it's in all of our self-interest to think about how to promote healthy aging it, from the most crass form in the, that if you're younger, you, you would like your parents and grandparents to be taken care of, you know, for their own sake and also so it relieves some of the burden on you because if you're lucky, you're going to age someday yourself. Uh, I mean, the demographic change happening in this country and in many parts of the, the developed world uh, suggests that we need to do more uh, to deal with this structural change in the population. And so um, I, I would expect it to, to happen, but the, look, the truth is we, we, we're gonna have to rebuild uh, so many things given where we are at this moment. I, I can't remember a moment in my lifetime where it felt like so much was so broken um, and where the task before us was to rebuild at the most fundamental level. And uh, look, let me thank you one more time for inviting me so that we could start a conversation about how to do this across our different disciplines uh, from downtown to uptown, uh, you know, and, 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 the, and the east side. Uh, I really hope those of us who are at NYU can find ways to do this together. Yeah.
Yeah, thank you very much, Eric, uh, for on, really on our behalf. I think we're very much on board for that uh, kind of partnership. And, uh, and the more so for hearing from you on uh, some uh, strategies forward, seriously. So, uh, so many thanks on behalf of everyone participating today uh, for just that remarkable uh, 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 keynote and discussion. Thank you. And I, and, I, I, and thank I, you. I should thank and you. I'm going to switch now uh, and uh, turn uh, back to the uh, to all uh, you participants. And we're going to. Uh, you're breaking up a little bit. Up. Oh, can you hear me? Now, yes. Oh, I just wanted to say the uh, final thing is that uh, I've been for the last several months working on a big uh, book project that's a sociological study of the pandemic. Uh, you know, really trying to understand what happened in New York City neighborhoods and different institutions. Uh, and, you know, anyone who's interested in uh, helping out or participating, uh, sharing knowledge, uh, expressing concerns to me, you know, please find me. It's just my eric.kleinenberg at nyu.edu or find me on Twitter. Uh, it would be uh, wonderful to find ways to collaborate. And uh, thank you again. I really enjoyed being here today. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Terrific. All right, everyone. Uh, I'm now we're going to switch uh, to the second half of our uh, program, which will be, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a panel on public policy initiatives to build social connectedness. And moderating the panel uh, will be Dr. Doug Judy, who will in turn introduce the panel uh, members, of which there are two. So just very briefly, uh, Dr. Judy is executive director of the Build Healthy Places Network, which is a, it's a national organization that catalyzes and supports collaboration across the sectors of community development and health with the goal of increasing investment in low-income neighborhoods, maximizing the health benefits of those kinds of investments and improving outcomes measurement. Prior to founding the network, Dr. Judy worked as a pediatrician for nearly 20 years in low-income community clinics and as a neonatal hospitalist. This research really focuses on the impact of social determinants of health on children's well-being and the policies and financial tools that can intervene to protect the health of vulnerable families and communities. So really a national leader at the interface of the very issues that we're tackling today. We're fortunate to have him moderating our panel discussion. So Doug, uh, passing the mic over to you. Great. Thank you, Mark. You can hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. All right. So let's have Dave and uh, Shirley join. Uh, yeah, thank you. It was really great listening to Eric. Uh, and our, our official mission of the Build Healthy Places Network is to shift the way organizations work across the health, community development, and finance sectors to collectively advance equity, reduce poverty, and improve health in neighborhoods across the United States. And I think what really struck me was as a, as a health disparities researcher, and before that, a clinician in a low-income community, what Eric's describing is absolutely right. And what I do now is really identify how do we finance these ideas? How do we actually get these things built and get monies into these neighborhoods? And what is exciting and what we'll at least touch upon here, which is really my work now, is that there are thousands of organizations and community development across the country doing this work, that, that healthcare systems that any of us could reach out and partner with, and in fact, billions, tens to hundreds of billions of dollars being directed towards communities, but not necessarily as effectively as it could be. And I think it does really play right into the social connectedness. So with that, uh, hi Dave, hi Shirley. Um, I'm gonna give quick introductions for you both. And then our, our, for our, our audience, our plan is to really have a, a conversation uh, rather than a panel per se, but really a, an interview conversation. And then we'll uh, turn to questions from the audience. So uh, first, I'm going to introduce Shirley Franklin. Uh, she's executive chair of the, bo uh, the board of Purpose Built Communities, which is a nonprofit consulting firm based in Atlanta that's a national leader in working side by side with local leaders to plan and implement holistic neighborhood and revitalization efforts that target education, housing, and community wellness simultaneously. Eric, I said at one point that most people don't get up and say, let's go build community. Well, that is actually exactly what Shirley does. And so she's a great person to have on the uh, panel today. 
Uh, however, Shirley's best known really as being the mayor of Atlanta uh, from 2002 to 2009, if I recall correctly, serving two terms. She was the first African-American female mayor of a major Southern city. Um, so a real leader uh, in, in, in her role. She's been in Atlanta for many years, 40 years working in public and community service. And I wanted just a couple things that I pulled. Um, she founded and co-chaired uh, the co-chairs, the United Way of Metropolitan Atlanta's Regional Commission on Homelessness and founded and chairs the National Center of Civil and Human Rights that sits in right down in downtown Atlanta uh, near Atlantic uh, Olympic Park. So our other speaker is Dave Chokshi. Uh, as many of you know, he's now commissioner of the New York uh, City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, which was a sudden switch from where being popu chief population health officer at the uh, New York City Health and Hospital System. And uh, he continues to take care of patients uh, as a primary care physician at Bellevue Hospital. His prior work included time in both the New York and Louisiana State Departments of Health. And I was struck by his uh, perhaps unusual experience with hurricanes. Uh, given that he was there uh, both for Hurricane Katrina before and after and served on a FEMA delegation in New York after Hurricane Sandy. So again, a lot of infrastructure uh, experience. He's been a White House fellow. He was a principal health advisor to the Secretary of Veterans Affairs and President Obama in 2016 uh, appointed him to the advisory group on prevention, health promotion and integrative and public health. So with that in mind, uh, we're going to turn, uh, I'm going to start with just a couple high level or just a high level-ish question for both of you uh, about your work. So we'll start with you, Shirley. So could you describe how you, as a public servant, let's focus on your time as mayor of Atlanta, how did you uh, seek to build social connection and community trust in your work? Uh, well, thank you. And I certainly enjoy um, uh, the presentation we've had so far. And uh, I love the conversation about infrastructure, because when I came into office, the issue of water infrastructure, sewer infrastructure was um, at the top of the list. And when people ask me um, what was the hardest thing that I did, I said the 20 hardest things I did was repair the city's um, to finance and build uh, the city's sewer system and upgrade the sewer system. Um, and the question really that was presented to us um, after the federal government in, uh, forced a, a consent decree with the city on improving combined sewers, um, the question was whether in fact we could make this $3 billion investment at the same time we could improve the communities that we were working in. So that a certain aspect, a certain amount of the work uh, was underground and and was going to be disruptive in terms of its building but would not have any obvious benefit to the community beyond clean water and rivers and streams so uh, fortunately there were a group of community activists uh, who insisted the city uh, review its plans so the result was that we ended up um, using uh, detention ponds and creating ponds in communities uh, with walking tracks and, and parks and very similar to what the professor has uh, been talking about as opposed to just a um, perhaps a wetland. Um, and but those ended up being gathering spots and gathering places uh, for people in communities that frankly hadn't had uh, upgrades in, in terms of their green space and parks. Those were not the primary focus, uh, but those those initiatives were built in um, along along a, a trail of parks uh, throughout the city. So, frankly, the city was not thinking about doing that. It was community activism, um, which Eric didn't talk a lot about. But a lot of the things that neighborhoods get come from community activism. So I would say I responded to that uh, in a way that I incorporated their ideas into the city's $3 billion uh, infrastructure improvements. Mm -hmm. No, I like that, Shirley. It's not that you like came in with all these ideas. You pulled these ideas from the community that was thinking this way. So it helped make them possible. Uh, <clears throat> so Dave, let's uh, talk a little about you. So you just recently stepped into the commissioner role, and of course you timed it perfectly with the worst public health crisis the city has faced in decades. So in your current context of the pandemic and associated economic shutdown, <clears throat> 
excuse me, how have you thought about the role of the health department in addressing social connectedness and trust? Um, well, thanks so much, Doug, and thanks also to Mark and, and NYU for hosting this. I'm really honored to get to be a part of this conversation with you uh, and with, um, with Shirley as well, whom I really admire, so thank you. Uh, and I, you know, I just can't think of anything that's more um, salient than talking about social connectedness and trust um, and its linkages to health at this moment. Um, there are so many ways, and I know we'll unpack uh, many of them, uh, in which um, it really bears upon uh, both the devastation of this moment, but also what it's going to take to recover uh, and hopefully build resilience uh, as we get through uh, the crises that we're confronting. So, you know, my, one of my starting points is the idea that um, everyone has become an epidemiologist. You know, we all uh, sort of know in a much um, more granular way how the virus now spreads. You know, all of us are, are more familiar with uh, the diagrams that show the reproduction number of a virus, how it goes from one person to two people to four people, um, and why that makes it, you know, so dangerous with respect to the degree of contagion. Um, but I think that we also have to kind of flip that paradigm on its head uh, and think equally about um, the social connectedness that already exists within our communities, um, that the virus is simply traveling along in many ways. Uh, and that, uh, you know, even though um, it's part of why uh, we're seeing transmission of the coronavirus, it's also a big part of the assets that we have to bring to bear uh, to combat this pandemic. Uh, so let me give you a couple of more concrete examples of what I'm thinking about. Um, you know, we heard, so I, I live in the neighborhood of Queens here in New York City. Um, we heard a lot about the multi-generational households that exist uh, in places like Queens, also in the Bronx, many other parts of the city. Um, and we heard about it in the context of uh, the virus being spread across different generations. But let's just think about that a little bit differently and recognize that when we take a wider lens view, you know, the wider angle, there is so much uh, benefit in having multi-generational households and multi-generational communities, particularly when we think about the fact that um, we're not just dealing with an infectious disease right now as our crisis, we're dealing with all of the parallel pandemics that come along with it. Uh, the stress, the mental health and trauma that people are experiencing, the difficulties with childcare and you know, taking care of other loved ones. And there are so many assets that our communities also have uh, that you know, just within one multi-generational household, um, we can think about uh, as a source of strength along with you know, a source of, uh, of vulnerability from the epidemiologic perspective. So you know, one of the ways that I've tried to synthesize this is um, just in thinking about our own department's work, where so much relies on getting the right information out, um, but getting it out in a way that actually precipitates action. And, you know, the way that I think about it is that we have to make the reproduction number of our public health guidance more contagious than the virus itself. You know, that's one of our tasks to make right. sure uh, that people are protecting themselves. Yeah, I like that. <clears throat> compete one viral idea with another one. <clears throat> uh, Shirley, let's come back. I'm going to ask you both another question in terms of just uh, deepening our conversation a little bit. So uh, Shirley, why don't we turn a little bit to your current work, uh, your community revi revitalization work, your purpose-built communities, and how this theme of social connectedness fits there. So trust is hard to build and hard to sustain, especially when bringing about change as, as you guys do. Um, connectedness can falter in the context of cultural and physical gentrification. Can you talk about some of the challenges, the trade-offs, the opportunities that you've seen uh, in the community development initiatives that you've been working in over the last 10 to 20 years? So, so I'd, li I'd like to talk about that, and I'd also like to follow up a little bit on what the commissioner just said. I mean, the ability to communicate, communicate clearly, and then to be telling the truth that people actually believe and can count on is fundamental to um, your success in developing trust and and then maintaining trust. When I am asked uh, what was what was my 
a major accomplishment, I say, gaining the trust of the people who live and work and invest in Atlanta and maintaining it. And it was a job every single day to do that. But in order to do that, there's, you have to bring transparency, you have to bring honesty, but you also have to bring a listening ear. And that listening ear is the same thing that we do uh, when we're working in communities um, with purpose-built communities. Uh, even though we have a 25-year history in Atlanta in a neighborhood and a 20-year history in two other cities with a model that was developed in Atlanta in the 1990s, in spite of the fact that we think we know how to do this work, we recognize when we go into communities uh, that we have to bring transparency, honesty, um, certainly a set of facts that are, that are evidence-based, uh, so evidence, but we also have to bring a listening ear. And just because we believe that we can make these changes, communities have to embrace that in order for that change to be deep and meaningful and long-term sustainable over time. Um, so the expertise is fine, uh, but the expertise has to be beyond a particular subject area. It has to be an expertise in communication and listening and understanding. So one of my favorite stories, I worked from the Olympics when it, uh, Atlanta held the Olympics in 1996. And my boss was a, a, one of the men who actually went after the Olympic Games on behalf of the city. He was a wonderful, he is a wonderful person. And a, he'd been a lawyer all of his life. He was used to uh, providing answers um, to clients. And we went to a community meeting of about 30 people in the community where we were going to develop the, the stadium, the Olympic Stadium. And he took voracious notes uh, during uh, the meeting. And that when it was time for him to speak, he went down through the notes and answered every single question uh, with a technical answer. And halfway through, I kind of um, elbowed him and said, you know, this is a listening session. We, solutions will come, but solutions need to come from collaboration. And that would be the last um, point that I would make. So we have one um, neighborhood where we've been working, um, and that community was a, is a food desert, or was a food desert. And the community knew that there was little chance of a large box um, grocery store. So they developed a co-op and small community grocery store, which they both staff and run, uh, and it has become a gathering spot. The, without community trust, that wouldn't have been possible because they would have been looking for a big box. Um, they want to be like everyone else, like the mall down the, you know, two or three miles away. So um, those, those are kind of the foundations of developing community trust and maintaining it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Shirley. And actually, it, it, you pointed something that uh, Mark asked earlier, which was what is the role, or a question from the audience, what is the role of healthcare? And in some cases, healthcare is well positioned to use its resources to actually, as you said, accelerate the actual creation of community resources, like a grocery store, for example. Toledo, Ohio, the hospital there actually built the grocery store itself. These things are possible. Uh, Dave, so <clears throat> you are dealing with, and the city is dealing with both the pandemic and the economic recession that's uh, come along with it. So how are you balancing, this is really getting quite directly at Eric's earlier comments, how are you balancing the social distancing, the physical distancing, to use a better term, while still encouraging the social connectedness uh, within, within the context that we're in? It's a great question. If I can start by, um, by actually trying to build on something that, uh, that I really appreciated that Mayor Franklin just said, you know, with respect to, um, to building trust and particularly building community trust. So, you know, as you did for many years, Doug, um, in terms of taking care of patients, you know, it's something that really shapes my worldview. And, um, and I, you know, think very simply to what it takes for me to build trust in an exam room. And it echoes, uh, you know, a lot of the things that Mayor Franklin talked about, um, starting with a listening ear, starting by eliciting someone's values, 
uh, and understanding what is at the top of their priority list rather than dictating what is at the top of their priority list based on what I think as a medical professional. And so all of those things um, you know, come into play arguably at an even more um, significant degree when you're talking about building community trust. And um, you know, let's unearth some of the, the really frank and challenging reasons why. Number one, we are often dealing with a, a dearth of trust to start with. We're operating at a deficit, you know, for um, historical reasons, uh, particularly when we're talking about communities of color, uh, because there are uh, deep-seated and uh, very rational uh, reasons that um, someone might not trust the healthcare system or, uh, or government. And so one of the ways that I've tried to sort of bring that perspective from the exam room into the work uh, that we're doing, particularly um, in uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, is to, um, to think about asking the question, not how can we build trust? Because there's almost an inherent arrogance in that by starting you know, and saying, let me build trust so I can get done what I need to get done at this moment rather than taking a step back and asking the question in an inward way and saying, am I trustworthy? Am I as an individual and am I as a government or an agency worthy of the people's trust, you know, whom I am relying upon? Uh, and I think that really changes the, the frame. Um, what I've observed is that it changes it in two ways. One is, and actually Shirley expressed this better than I could, but you know, just thinking about the, um, the, the definition of trust as the union of competence, transparency, and motive, and really thinking that you, you have to have each of those three dimensions sort of come together. Uh, you can't just be scientifically competent. You can't have someone believe that you're operating with good intentions. You have to demonstrate all of those, you know, in concert. But then the second piece of it is really to bring to bear humility in everything that we do. Um, because humility is what we have to acknowledge um, when we say uh, that we are trying to become worthy of someone's trust. And what it means is that instead of coming in as uh, some sort of, of savior or having the tools to help someone, it shifts it, you know, in a way that says, who are the people who have actually done the hard work of earning trust over years? And how is it that I can actually partner with them to achieve what may be common ends, rather than trying to, you know, instantaneously um, build a trust that is, uh, that is actually very difficult to earn in the first place for good reasons. So, you know, the last thing that I'll say just more, more directly to your question, Doug, about, um, uh, you know, social distancing and social connectedness uh, and, and also sort of inherent in your question is the idea of economic recovery and public health. Uh, I think, you know, the, the most that I can say about this is that we, we really have to challenge those false dichotomies. Um, and I think that's, you know, where you're going with the way that you're asking the question. Um, you know, for us to think about the fact that, uh, that we can use something like social connectedness to actually get people to think about physical distancing in a different way. If we can, you know, um, make the case that suppressing the virus is vital to our economic recovery and ultimately, you know, to health resilience, then we can take these things uh, together and try to address them in concert rather than um, trying to put different communities at odds to one another. Yeah, thank you. No, you had a lot. Uh, there, there was a lot, lot in there to uh, think about, uh, and I think the, uh, uh, I like the just the, the the build the building trust is not a term we should ever talk with people about. You build trust by doing and listening and not talking about mm -hmm. the act of it. Um, so I want to. Uh, this is a question for both of you. Uh, in terms of you've both had a chance to describe some of the tactics and what you think about it, but uh, and this actually relates to a question that's come into the Q and A is how, how have you seen the tactics or strategies that one might use for building connectedness? How do they vary by the type of neighborhood we're working in? If it's a 
a stagnant neighborhood versus a gentrifying neighborhood, a low income neighborhood versus a mixed income neighborhood. Does the approach vary? Do you have a sense of that or experience in that? Uh, Shirley, why don't we start with you? Well, I, I mean, I'll, sure. Um, I mean, that's an excellent question. And the, the answer is yes. And it varies version of the country. Um, and I mean, whether the community is uh, fast paced and growing or whether it is, you know, the, the economy is stagnant. Uh, in um, Omaha, um, uh, the community really, the community where we're working uh, started working on building trust with each other and actually working towards understanding what the possibilities were in North Omaha. Uh, and it was the result of the about 200 professionals, uh, largely African-American professionals, but not only, who basically got to know each other around the topic, across discipline, across neighborhood, around the topic of, do we want to live in a place that is healthier and better for our families? And it took them two years of workshops and interactions and, um, and arguments and disagreements. And I was invited in because that same group of 200 had decided that they, they were going to actually doing the work to change the physical space. And I was invited to come for a few days and spend and uh, convincing them that their work as a group was done and that they really needed to break off into smaller groups so that the cultural district or the housing uh, mm. and ultimately do a, a, a purpose-built community. Very different than going into Spartanburg, which is a community of 40, where they had a former mayor who was leading the charge although saying he was not leading it, um, that people were inclined to follow his lead <laughs> because, he, because they trusted him already. Uh, and he basically introduced the model. So I think uh, there is no question that different strategies, I wouldn't use the word tactics as much as I would say strategies are used in order to develop a consensus around what the specific goals are with place-based development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dave. And just to um, pick up on on some of those strands, um, you know, I think that uh, it, it comes to mind sort of in a very tangible way with respect to what we're trying to do to um, to stop the spread of coronavirus uh, right now and over the last few months here in New York City. And um, you know, the starting point is that uh, New York City is an incredibly uh, diverse city ethnically and culturally, um, but also, you know, in terms of uh, income, in terms of, um, you know, immigration status of our populations along so many dimensions. Uh, you know, I know we have many New Yorkers on the call, so, so you're all very familiar with that. And so the starting point, if you want to get anything done in public health or community development, is uh, to bake that into our approach, you know, with respect to understanding that you will never be able to bring a one size fits all uh, policy, you know, into the variegated neighborhoods that exist in a place like New York City. So, um, you know, one of the ways that we've really tried to uh, bring that to bear in our COVID response is um, by trying to take a data driven approach to understanding uh, both how the virus is spreading in a particular community um, but also how that overlays along the, char the pre-existing characteristics of that community, and then really learning from that uh, to figure out what it is that we need to deploy. So, you know, for example, in parts of Brooklyn, uh, we realized there was a lot of misinformation spreading around uh, the notion of herd immunity. So really that was something that we had to, you know, figure out how to um, use trusted messengers to combat. Um, then we saw some upticks in other parts of the city. In parts of the Bronx, uh, we found that uh, the, the very you know, entrenched uh, disparities around healthcare access meant that uh, people both didn't have enough access to testing from the supply perspective,
but even when we brought to bear additional testing resources, you know, you had to get the word out in a way to, to actually get the demand for testing uh, up to the degree that we wanted. Um, and then more recently in Staten Island, you know, we found that, that mask wearing, which unfortunately has become uh, politicized, uh, was something that we really had to take on in a different way. So if the starting point is to account for, you know, those degrees of variability, it really informs, you know, what your approaches look like. Um, you know, I'll just tie that from the very, you know, current uh, notion of, of fighting the pandemic to what we need to do more broadly. And, you know, there are just two concepts that I would introduce when we talk about that. The first is that, um, and, and you know, Mayor Franklin has, uh, has alluded to this already, but we have to talk about investment and addressing historical disinvestment and making sure that the way that resources are flowing into communities um, account for those, uh, those historical patterns of injustice. So um, that's one piece that, that uh, has to be different, you know, depending on what has happened in a community over time. The second one that I think about a lot from the health perspective is to look for the vicious cycles that exist in, um, in creating uh, illness in our communities. You know, whether it's poverty leading to illness, leading to more poverty, or, um, you know, uh, mental health issues leading to homelessness, uh, which leads to other behavioral health issues. There are too many examples where um, you know, people are caught in these vicious cycles that end up being catastrophic to them as individuals, but often have intergenerational effects as well. And so part of our task uh, from the public health standpoint is to uh, disentangle what those vicious cycles are and figure out you know, in a very um, uh, scientific, but also human way, what are the things that we can do to actually interrupt those vicious cycles and at least start to turn them into virtuous cycles uh, for people? Uh, so housing first is a great example of a policy, you know, that does that. Um, you know, there, there are uh, other examples as well, but I think that that framework is something that I find helpful to think about in the face of um, these deep seated, you know, interlocking challenges, our task is what is it going to take to turn a vicious cycle into a virtuous cycle? Mm -hmm. I appreciate that, Dave. And I, I think as well about, uh, you know, what, what are, what systems benefit from the current system that, you know, the, these, 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 these mechanisms, these, these cycles persist because there are systems making them persist and identifying who's benefiting. I mean, it's a way, it's a bad way of thinking about it, but there, there are benefits to having a lot of sick people and a lot of poor people, and we need to figure out how to undo those, uh, those, those structures. Can I, can I, just, oh, yeah, can I just get into that? I mean, because um, um, I'm, the housing first model is one I'm familiar with because we actually came to New York when I was in office to look at that model where, where we were trying to address the issues of homelessness and people wanted to address it in a lot of different ways. But one of the most successful was to provide the stability of housing. And then to add, once you provo provided that uh, stability uh, and made that step, then you had an opportunity to actually provide services and support in a different way. So uh, we really appreciate um, uh, the success of that. But I, I would also say that timing is an issue. What, 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 mm -hmm. One of the things that's interesting about housing first is that it solves one of the problems everyone knows that that's not the only problem an individual or family might have but it is a problem that is um core uh to your ability to work with someone long term so you've got it you've got to it's not everything can be done overnight now in our in our business of community development at purpose built we can take six months a year two years to work with the community. Um, the commissioner, on the other hand, with COVID, doesn't have that latitude. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and that makes it even more difficult around the pandemic and, and contagious diseases. So I, my hat's off to him. I thought I had a hard job um, with sewers, but uh, my hat is off <laughs> to him. 
right? <clears throat> um, well, sticking to a couple, and I know we've got a, we'll, we'll make sure we get to some questions from uh, the audience as well. There's a couple have come in. Um, sticking to some of the ones we planned on, uh, very narrowly, let's talk about uh, the role of trust and dialogue in the communities we're working in around the future vaccine. We now are getting good news. There's likely to be a vaccine. Uh, but how are we going to ensure that the patients who need it most uh, will, in fact, be able to, well, I guess le less about the distribution and more about the trust to actually get get the shot itself. Mm -hmm. And I know, Shirley, you actually, as I recall, there was an event at Purpose Built in asking residents to participate in some of the trials. I don't know if there's anything you would say about that or or what's your sense about the... Um, well, my sense vaccine? about that is that clearly um, community-based organizations that work in communities over time ought to be a part of the network uh, that healthcare um fields and our healthcare organizations use um just from my political experience i mean having a point of entry through a trusted mm -hmm. a trusted partner is going to be key and in trusted places to go back to uh what eric said earlier i mean places where people normally uh and routinely gather and they gather for the purpose of um, being together, but also gather for the purpose of gaining knowledge or doing something together like one might do at a library. So I, mm -hmm. I'm, I have no doubt that the commissioners thought about that. Yeah, exactly. Being in a familiar place would be important around familiar people. Yeah, Dave, uh, how, how, are, how are you guys thinking about tackling this, this trust issue around the future vaccine? Yeah, well, we've made it, you know, one of our mantras that um, trust is an essential ingredient for turning a vaccine into a vaccination. So even when we have, mm -hmm. you know, a safe and effective shot, um, the path that it has to travel uh, for uh, people and communities to actually accept it um, has many more steps uh, that we need to think through uh, carefully, not just the logistics of getting the vaccine delivered, um, but really the, uh, the psychology of why, you know, some people, uh, are more likely or less likely to, um, to accept a vaccine. So this is something we're thinking about deeply, um, in part because it, it belies easy solutions for the reasons that we talked about earlier. You know, we are, um, uh, we're swimming against the tide of uh, historical injustice, uh, particularly among um, black and brown New Yorkers, where uh, there is a very um, painful and real legacy of uh, of distrust in the healthcare establishment, um, you know, for, uh, you know, for, as I alluded to, for good reasons, frankly, over, uh, over decades. But, um, you know, Mayor Franklin uh, laid out the path that we also want to travel, which is you have to rely on trusted messengers, uh, trusted places, um, and again, have the humility to, uh, to know when something is your job, versus when it's time to pass the baton and say, you know, this is now as far as I can go, I have to let you take on this last mile of actually getting the shot in someone's arm. And so we're really trying to think about who the specific people and institutions are. Again, community by community, you know, we can't do this in a, in a sort of monolithic citywide approach. Um, but figuring out, you know, who those people are so that the voice is not uh, just mine, although hopefully you can see my, my flu vaccine button here because, uh. you know, we do have to provide uh, the right information. Um, but then, you know, make sure that we're partnering with federally qualified health centers, with, uh, you know, the, the one and two doc practices who have been taking care of patients and frankly families for, um, for years upon years. Um, we've started doing this in some of our other approaches to COVID. For example, in some of those areas where I alluded to the fact that we just weren't seeing people coming out to our testing sites, we rethought our strategy and we said, hey, why don't we just give our testing supplies, our kits, even the machines themselves to the local clinicians because they're seeing patients already. You know, it's just a matter of matching up the demand with the supply. Um, so let's take a step back here rather than bringing even more resources in and say that the right solution to this is actually to deploy resources through people um, who are more trusted. And then the final thing that I'll say is that we are thinking really hard about um, 
trying to lay the groundwork for our COVID vaccination campaign through our flu vaccination campaign. Mm. All of the things that we're gonna see play out with the COVID vaccine play out, frankly, every year with our flu vaccine. So we shouldn't be surprised, you know, because we see, uh, for example, that black New Yorkers and Latinx New Yorkers uh, generally get vaccinated at lower rates. So why don't we use this fall as an opportunity to start to test out those strategies, figure out what works, um, so that we can, uh, you know, take on what is uh, going to be the, uh, you know, one of the most historic mass vaccination campaigns likely in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dave, why don't I build on that with a question that came in. Uh, Gregory Burke asked, uh, how are you working with small primary care practices that tend to have high levels of trust in the community where they practice? This is a really important question. Thank you, Greg. Um, I know Greg actually has a, a, a lot of... Um, personal uh, and professional experience with this um, as well. And uh, in a place like New York City, it's easy to get lost in the, the gleaming towers of academic medical centers, you know, in the large uh, medical networks, medical practices. But he's absolutely right that so many people, and particularly uh, people who are living in boroughs outside of Manhattan, you know, people who, uh, whose only source of medical care are those smaller practices, um, you know, it's very important for us to have a strategy for those small practices as well. Um, we have a, a group that is dedicated to working specifically with those small practices. It's known as the Primary Care Information Project, and they're thinking actively about, you know, what more we can do in that realm. Um, but part of it is also uh, figuring out how we can shore up uh, the natural assets that exist in those practices, the trust that they've built up, you know, the manpower and the deep uh, history of expertise that they have uh, through those practices with what they don't have, which is, you know, do they have enough freezer capacity for mm -hmm. a vaccine? And if not, how do we solve those logistics to actually get them, you know, uh, working um, to help us with vaccination? Do they have um, the right type of manpower, you know, to support uh, what we're trying to do with testing or vaccination, or can we build some shared services models to extend across multiple of those smaller practices? So um, we're trying to think creatively about that as well. Mm -hmm. Surely, actually, uh, uh, this question about primary care practitioners, primary care doctors, um, do you, have you seen a role or do you see a role for the purposeful communities work or community building in terms of uh, using their voice or engaging them uh, in the community building work you do? Um, we haven't seen it as much as we've seen it, the leadership coming, the local leadership coming out of um, neighborhood associations and the faith community. Um, mm. But, I mean, it clearly, as this model develops over time, it clearly is an area where we can extend our, extend our reach. Um, the in the African American community in the South, especially a city like Atlanta, uh, the faith community has been an important gathering place. Uh, and even when you're not going into the facility, to be in and around that. So a lot of the COVID testing now uh, is done on in the parking lot of of the church or the temple. Uh, and it's interesting because there are other parking lots you could use. But they, it, there is something about that place being safe and, and trying to demystify and frankly assure people that this is going to be a safe uh, endeavor around just COVID testing. And I, I've noticed that um, in the last few months, not everyone wants to go into a clinic or mm -hmm. into a mm -hmm. hospital, but will go to the neighborhood uh, parking lot of a, of a church or a temple. Um, we we believe at Purpose Built that one of the best places to meet folks and to work on these tough issues is in a neighborhood, not a quadrant of the city, but in a neighborhood where people mm -hmm. come together. Uh, they live, they spend time there, they shop there, they know their neighbors. If not all of their neighbors, they know some of their neighbors. Uh, and our job at Purpose Build is to be sure that we are building on those relationships that already exist. Mm -hmm. That's great. And, and Greg, actually, I could add as well that I've written a bit on 
I get this question a lot as a pediatrician from my pediatric colleagues. Well, investing in neighborhoods sounds great, but what is my role? And I actually think it's uh, doctors sometimes forget, especially primary care physicians, forget how credible and how valuable their voice is to help move forward things that may be hitting walls internally within a community. And, you know, it's one thing for a housing developer to make the case for more affordable housing. Well, people are suspicious of that. But if the doctor or the hospital comes in and says, no, really, this is important for the following reasons, it can actually uh, really build the case. Um, I have a couple of good questions from uh, Jennifer Alcantara Castillo. Uh, the first, I may have been directed at Eric, but I think it actually is pertinent here, um, which is how do we measure, how do we know that social infrastructure, the sort of trust building is working, that it's valuable? Are there, health, is there, are there healthcare outcomes? You know, we talked earlier about the ROI of it, but it is it is helpful to know that that the the social infrastructure being put in the trust building is actually working is, do either of you have thoughts about ways or what we should look for for evidence of impact well unfortunately we're beginning to see more and more uh severe weather uh conditions um and you know in some places it's fires in some places it's floods it's wind storms i mean and what we see in communities that are organized at the neighborhood level, people are, are coming forward and helping each other and the response is much quicker. It's not instead of um, the government response, but the response is kind of grounded in the relationships that already exist. So whether it was the um, schools being closed and children um, and families not having enough to eat as a result of COVID and losing jobs, and not having enough money, people are helping each other more, and there is a systematic uh, approach to that that we would not, we didn't see as much, or didn't expect to see as much um, pre-COVID or some of these weather events. Mm -hmm. So it's really about measuring the resilience, the community's ability to respond to some of these issues as yes. a, a measure of success. Yeah, Dave, thoughts about measuring this sort of stuff? Yeah, I, well, I just have a simple thought, and um, and I should say th this is uh, unfortunately going to be my my last contribution, just because I have to jump off a bit early. So forgive me for that. Um, no, I, I agree with uh, with the way that uh, Mayor Franklin uh, is is thinking about it. Um, my thought on this is is really quite a simple one, hopefully not simplistic, but too often, and I think about this particularly, you know, in the healthcare uh, system. We, we just don't take the simple step of asking people, you know, mm -hmm. do yeah. you trust? Do you trust X? Um, and seeing how that changes over time. And I think it's an important thing to build into, um, you know, to how we think about the quality uh, of a system, whether it's a healthcare system or another system to say, how is that changing over time? And most importantly, how do we hold ourselves accountable for driving changes over time? And I think that, again, gets back to the notion of, um, you know, if I'm doing something, but uh, I'm not being trusted by the person that I intend to serve, then I'm probably not doing it right. And so then that provokes that introspection of why is it that I am not worthy of that person's trust. Um, and so I wonder if maybe some of these, you know, simpler ways to start can actually help to get, um, get the dialogue that we need uh, for the more complicated issues. And with that, I'm gonna drop okay, off. Thank you again. Let you go. Well, thank nice you so much. You. Uh, yeah, so actually it's, it's interesting. And Shirley, we'll, we'll, we'll continue for another couple of minutes with you um, before Mark comes back to close us down. But, um, yeah, for the audience, this is something that comes up a lot is uh, there are standardized questionnaires around trust. There are surveys around um, hope. There are surveys around uh, do you believe your child is going to be more, have more opportunity than you have? And those can be, those can change faster than things like chronic disease measurements. Um, so I think Dave is really uh, putting a point right on it. Um, I would uh, just add, I, yeah. I, I, I was... Uh, we were trying to figure out how to pay for the sewer system and it was expensive. <laughs> yeah. No, and we knew we had to raise rates uh, right. and we thought, you know, maybe we should do a sales tax. So we proposed a sales tax 
and I was running into a kind of a corner store, not in my neighborhood, but in someone else's neighborhood one Saturday morning when I was mayor and I drove up and uh, parked my car and ran in. Why I wanted to get the cheapest price for M&Ms, I don't know. But, um, but anyway, I ran in the store uh, and it was kind of a long line. And when it was mine, um, the, the clerk said to me, well, can you ask, answer some questions about this sewer, sewer tax again? And she engaged me in a series of questions and I provided some answers about how the sales tax would impact her water bill, her monthly water bill. Mm. That's basically what she wanted to know. Yeah. But it was that exchange that made me know that we had a chance because she trusted that I had some answers that were going to be beneficial to actually mm. to her monthly expenses. So, I mean, the commissioner's point is it's, list, it's asking, but it's also listening. And it's going to the unfamiliar place to ask the question, not just the familiar mm -hmm. place, not just the formality of um, someone with a title or a position, but just the average everyday person. Mm -hmm. um, this young woman was probably making $8 an hour in Atlanta. And so the notion that I was going to add a one cent sales tax to her, her bill made a big difference to her and could not be diminished. Um, and of course, won that, we won that referendum with 75% of the vote. <laughs> <laughs> but, but because people understood it. Yeah. People understood it. Well, and it, yeah, what you're saying, I think, is that it's not about, it's not about, like, you could have had a whole bunch of big statistics about how good it would be for the overall region or for the economy or the health problems if you didn't do it. But you needed to answer the specific question she had. What about my bills and why does it matter to me personally? Exactly. Because trust is not something that's sprinkled from an airplane. It's something mm -hmm. that is gained between people. It's developed mm -hmm. between individuals and people, small groups of people. Yeah. A couple, I think we've got time for a couple more quick questions. And I'll just ask you, since we have you, um, one question that uh, this is actually uh, Jennifer again said, um, you know, how do we ensure that improvements in neighborhoods by way of better social infrastructure don't contribute to gentrification in those neighborhoods? So we work really hard at it. Number one, we recognize that it's a possibility. Number two, I happen to think we make public investment uh, in housing and, and in, in um, maintaining uh, op housing opportunities uh, for people, low, low moderate income people. And then we, then we make sure that those, that everyone in the community, regardless of income and background, is involved in um, setting the course in the, and the goals for the community. So people have to feel welcome. We can't mm -hmm. cancel them out just because they live in the neighborhood and say they're not a part of it. So we don't need to make it, um, we need to lower the barriers for entry into the discussion and decision making for the community. So people are not looking automatically to leave. And then we need to help each other. If you, mm -hmm. if you are low income earning person in America, and you lose your job or your child gets sick or um, a family member needs your help. I mean, you don't have the safety net that a lot of other people have. So we've got to have systems in place uh, to help you when, when you have hard times as you are trying to uh, improve your situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I uh, just to follow up on that, um, I'm, I'm writing a piece right now for academic pediatrics about child poverty and the role of neighborhood investment. And one of the things that I found digging into it was that, and I think you and I have talked about this, is that there is a concern about gentrification, but there's a lot of stagnation that a lot of places are not suffering from gentrification. It's in fact the historic disinvestment that continues that if we, I don't want to say worry too much about gentrification, but we have to balance that with the need to drive investments. Do you have thoughts about sort of? No, absolutely. I mean, okay. absolutely. In there, there are neighborhoods that are not getting investment and people are, um, they're locked out of the main, you know, the main economy. Um, and they, there may be 10 or 15% of ownership in those communities or maybe even 30%, but the vast majority of people are, are, are not 
homeowners uh, and they are stuck where they are. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and in sometimes in housing of last resort. So we can't just, we can't worry about it so much um, that we don't take care of the issues that are at hand. But a mixed income housing strategy uh, allows you to do both, basically to stabilize, help to stabilize the community and attract the amenities. At the same time, you accommodate the needs of the people who are earning the, less, the least amount of money, uh, recognizing that we can't fix everything about the about the economy but we can make it um we can make it more stable for people who are earning less great well thank you i know well, mark you're back so i'm guessing you'd like to wrap up i think i i think so it, and we're, we're nearing the top of the hour so uh so so that's exactly right but i think this conversation i mean actually i could listen to it uh for for a lot longer so uh so i hate to interrupt but uh but we're almost at three o'clock so you know here's extending just strong thanks uh really not just from myself but i think on behalf of everybody who's listening to to both of you to to you uh dr judy to former mayor franklin to commissioner choksi to eric kleinenberg really just like an incredible set of discussions um and uh you know also i think intently attended i've done a lot of zoom meetings this attendance has been just about completely flat the whole time i think it speaks to the truths that you're uh sharing and uh really to the hunger all of our hunger uh about this so um you know to everyone really just like hold in your thoughts some of the uh what we've heard today i mean uh you know keeping ourselves knit together can be hard work but i think it's all important work and it offers a path too for awakening and uh channeling uh hope and 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 a lot of forward motion so supporting social infrastructure uh really from community activism through to public advocacy to investment financing it too i mean uh Mayor franklin talked at the when she first mentioned the sewer project sort of the need to engage with community um but also with investors so really as a public official like holding both of those uh very much in mind at the same time thinking about trust i mean i think we heard some 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 pretty deep uh comments uh about that including you know asking oneself and as an agency certainly if we're thinking about the public sector acting asking itself am i trustworthy is uh, are we trustworthy and and thinking about what it takes to actually build that over time um and uh and interrupting vicious cycles and sort of uh beginning to uh, uh turn them in a more positive direction so some of these are i think are really just paths that can help us as a group uh and individually too shake some of the inertia uh uh that is brought on by the enduring toughness of all these layers um that can be layered on by uh by something like uh the situations that we're in we're going to circulate a recording of today's session in a follow-up email and encourage you very much to share it with your colleagues who couldn't join it today and also to watch it over and over and over yourselves uh stay tuned we'll be sending out an announcement in the in uh, uh ahead uh about the 2021 health ant conference for which we promise a, a, a almost similarly compelling theme um uh and uh so that'll follow and you know we're really all fighting this virus and the other crises that we referred to uh, and it's doing a number on some of the threads that tie us together uh but i think we we we're reminded today that progress moves uh, at the speed of trust and that there are strategies sort of uh, socially at the community level and, uh, and everything in between for, for, uh, for moving that forward. So here's thanking our presenters again, wishing everyone a really great rest of day and with a little more spring in our uh, collective step as we move forward and weave ourselves a little more uh, tightly together uh, for change. Thank you very much and uh and and uh i wish we could now gather around and uh uh catch up with one another uh but it's not the format for that uh next time take care everybody <laughs>